Well, I, I have been uniquely excited all week. We are launching in the book of Mark. Um, the book of Mark is certainly probably my favorite book in the Bible, if, if maybe second, maybe tied only with, with Romans. So as a church, this has just been incredible. We just finished Romans, and uh, now we're launching the book of Mark. So I, I couldn't be more thrilled. And I just, as I looked forward to um, this, this uh, Sunday morning, I just kept praying and kept thinking about you all and thinking about this church, this congregation. And, and my longing is that this book will be such a means of grace for us as a congregation, um, that we would see Christ more clearly, that we would love Christ more, and that we would follow him without fear. And uh, that's what this book will do for us. Uh, the book of Mark is living and active. It has that kind of power. And uh, we're going to just kind of briefly look at that this morning. So as we, as we kind of begin a whole new study as a church, I think it's appropriate to just consecrate this series to the Lord. So I just want to ask everyone to just bow and pray with me as we think about what the Lord will do through the Gospel of Mark. Father, we love you because you loved us, and we love you because you sent your Son, Jesus. And Lord, I'm so thankful that every Lord's Day we, we can gather and sing your praises and take communion and remember your Son's death and resurrection on our behalf. And even, even with all of those benefits, Lord, I know that my heart is prone, prone to be too casual toward your son. I'm, too, I'm prone to be too casual toward you. And I pray, Lord, that the gospel of Mark might stir us up, that it might show to us in new and fresh ways the glory of your Son and your own glory. I pray that we would learn its lessons and learn its lessons well. I want to pray on behalf of this church that as we, as we dive into this glorious book, this profound biography of your Son, I pray that you would give us grace because there will no doubt be points in the study of the book of Mark where we will be overwhelmingly impressed with you. And there will be points where we, no doubt, will be convicted uh, beyond description. And I pray for grace in those moments when we see things about you and then in contrast see things about ourselves. I pray that you would give us grace even now to be ready for those moments, to respond with humility there would be true change, that we would truly be a people who worship God the Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, if, if anything were to happen from examining the book of Mark, it ought to be that we, your people, would worship your Son. We pray this knowing that we don't even know yet what we're praying in full. We pray this knowing that we're praying beyond our understanding, but Lord, fill, a, fill in the gaps as we study the book of Mark. Strengthen us, mature us, grow us, give us greater conviction, and empower us that we would be able to walk faithfully on the path following your Son in the discipleship that will cost us every ambition. Help us to live this way, we pray, simply for your glory, uh, for the glory of that you have and that you own and that you possess and that subjectively we might ascribe to you the glory that is due your name uh, by following you on the path of discipleship because we are your children, Lord Jesus Christ. We are your brothers and thank you so much for purchasing our souls. So Lord, we just con consecrate this study to you and we ask that it would mark another, another season of profound grace toward the testimony and the outreach of this church to this community. In your name we pray. Amen. I remember studying the book of Mark as a new believer, and I was told that the theme of Mark is Mark chapter 10, verse 45. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bible and look at that verse for a moment. And I'm going to actually correct that view, because I've found that that's not quite 
enough. It doesn't quite account for everything that Mark is doing. But nevertheless, it's a sweet verse, and it's worthy of every Christian memorizing this verse. Mark chapter 10, verse 45 Jesus himself says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that certainly is a a profound verse. It has staggering implications, and it really is the heart of the gospel summed up in one verse. It's pretty hard to improve upon. But as I studied the book of Mark, I realized, you know, that profound truth is actually serving another purpose in Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel is doing something bigger than just that. Mark's gospel is is a powerful, powerful biography of Jesus Christ, just like the other four, but the unique thing about Mark is its its focus. If Mark had a focus or a a theme, a theme statement or a thesis, it comes in chapter 1, verse 1. So we'll let Mark give us the thesis. Chapter 1, verse 1, this is the point of the Gospel of Mark. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I think what's staggering about that is what's so unique when you compare it to the other Gospels. You know, Jesus Jesus is uh, the subject of all four Gospels. And the theme of Matthew might well be that Jesus is the king of Israel. And it makes sense that Matthew would describe uh, Jesus that way. And he starts his gospel with a genealogy, tracing it all the way back to Abraham, the father of the Jews, through David, the king of the Jews. And it makes sense that Jesus is the subject of Luke. And Luke's gospel, the theme of Luke, might well be that Jesus is the son of man, the second Adam who's come to regain and reverse the curse. And so, of course, Luke also includes a genealogy, and he traces it all the way back to Adam. And, of course, Jesus is the subject of John, and John's theme is that Jesus is the Messiah. I've written these things to you so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. And so they all have their own unique theme, and Mark's theme is that Jesus is the Son of God. There's not, a, there's not a more divine emphasis on Jesus Christ than in the Gospel of Mark. And in some way or in some fashion, every narrative in the Gospel of Mark contributes to that purpose. Now, I know that you expected me to say that. It's the Gospel of Mark. It's God's Son. Got it. Check. And in order to kind of appreciate the uniqueness of Mark's gospel, I want to borrow and appeal to someone's testimony about their reading of the gospel of Mark who did not have that familiarity. Gunther Zuntz was a Greek scholar. He was a a classicist. He studied the Greek classics. So he was well-versed in uh, Greco-Roman biography. He'd read many of them. But he had never read... um, the Gospel of Mark. He was not a Christian. He was largely unfamiliar, unfamiliar with Christianity or any of its literature. And so he comes to the Gospel of Mark as an expert, completely familiar with the genre of biography and completely familiar with the language. And he understood how to dive right in and, and read Mark for all it's worth. And here's his testimony. I kind of think this testimony might be what it would have been like for the the semi-educated individual reading Mark in Mark's own day. He speaks of his, quote, strong impression that something very important was being put forward here with a superior purpose and concentration throughout the book. The style and content of the story arouse a feeling of otherness, a feeling this is not a history like other histories, not a biography like other biographies, but a development of the actions sayings and sufferings of a higher being on his way through this anxious world of human beings and demons. That's from an unbeliever who reads Mark once and is blown away by the radical otherness of this individual, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the subject of this gospel, of course, is Jesus Christ, but its focus is Jesus Christ as the Son of God And its purpose is radical. Mark expects us 
to embrace Christ as the Son of God and follow him entirely, fearlessly, and boldly on the path that he has set out for. And we're going to do a few things this morning. They're kind of like traditional, typical, introductory materials. You know, you think about when you dive into a new book, you want to learn about it, you need to understand some things about it, and we want to have some common familiarity about the book of Mark before we dive in, you know, chapter 1, verse 1, and just launch. And those are important things, but I'm actually going to try to be somewhat abbreviated on some of the traditional introductory matters. I want to hopefully point out how Mark structures his gospel and then just work through the gospel, because I don't want to leave you here without a sermon. I don't want this to be a lecture on stuff about Mark. I, I want you to have a sermon. So um, I'm going to roughly limit my, my, the scope of my subject this morning to Mark chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 16, verse 8. We're going to limit it to that, and we're going to be content with that this morning, all right? So if you want more, then just keep reading Luke or something. But to, this morning, we're just limiting our scope to the book of Mark. But before we do that, I do want to just say that uh, Mark, John Mark, is a uh, friend of Peter and Paul. He's, he shows up in the New Testament uh, in several locations, and here's a, here's a chronological record of him. He shows up in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, and Peter had been in prison. He was busted out miraculously by the angel. And when Peter realized that he was, he was not dreaming anymore, Acts 12, verse 12 says, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So the early church, when they hear the apostle Peter was in prison, they go to John Mark's mom's house. And so it's just incredible that from the very beginning of the story, uh, here you have John Mark involved. In chapter 12, verse 25, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, um, and when they, had when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. So Mark is now accompanying uh, Paul and Barnabas on their way back to Antioch. In chapter 13, verse 5, um, it says that when they reached Salamis in the first missionary journey, they, re they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. That's John Mark. And the helper would be an assistant who would help with all the documentation and all the paperwork, and so he clearly was very skilled at that sort of thing, obviously, as we read his book. In Acts chapter 15, verse 37, in the second missionary journey, this is the famous conflict between uh, Paul and Barnabas. They have a dispute over John Mark, and their disagreement is whether he was useful and whether they should keep him or not. And Paul was saying no, and Barnabas was saying yes. And so Barnabas took Mark and went off to Cyprus, and, and Paul went on his, on his missionary journey. But the story doesn't end there. If you fast forward to the prison epistles, um, in Colossians and Philemon, um, John Mark comes up again. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome, welcome him. So Mark, John Mark was Barnabas' cousin. And by the time Paul is in prison, in his first imprisonment, they obviously are, there's no conflict, there's no, there's no love lost. They are clearly on the same team, encouraging one another in the ministry. Philemon, verses 23 and 24, Paul writes, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. So by the time Paul is imprisoned, he is able to call John Mark his fellow laborer. He viewed him as a comrade in ministry, somebody who shared in the, in the burden of ministry and somebody who knew um, Paul's ministry well. And the same is true of Peter. In fact, when Peter ends his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, he mentions Mark. It says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings and likely referring to the church in Rome. And so does my son Mark. And so Peter calls Mark his son. He is a son in the faith. He's come to Christ through Peter's ministry. And Mark was personally aware of Peter's own ministry and his own teaching. And then finally, the last mention we have of him is uh, shortly before Paul dies in his second imprisonment, the second imprisonment that we know about in Rome. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. Mark is useful to Paul for service. He was there throughout virtually the massive majority of the book of Acts, converted by Peter's ministry, a son of the faith to Peter the Apostle. Personal acquaintance with Peter and Paul's ministry. And Paul can say, he's useful to me. 
As far as his gospel, though, what we know about Mark's gospel is largely limited to um, the tradition of the early church fathers. And I'm just going to read a few, few comments that kind of explain how to think about Mark. Irenaeus, who was, uh, you know, second century, um, so 130 to 200 AD, is about when, when Irenaeus lived, he says this. He says that Matthew wrote a gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, and that was, several church fathers said that, his, that Matthew drafted his gospel in, in Aramaic. And uh, while, Pe- while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundation of the church, after their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Now that's unanimous among all the church fathers. Every single church father says, Mark recorded what Peter's eyewitness about Jesus really was. And then he goes on to talk about Luke and John, and I'll skip all of that for now. Another church father, Papias, was even earlier. He was born in around 60 AD. And get this, Papias, he, he was a bishop in, in, in what's modern-day Turkey. He was a leader of a church there. But this is interesting. Papias was a guy who, he was personally discipled by Polycarp, who in turn was personally discipled by the, the, the Apostle John. And so um, Papias knew he had direct access to, you know, through, to some of the, uh, the Apostles' discussions about what had happened in, in Jesus' day. And he says this, he says that in his writing, he passed, oh, this is Eusebius talking about Papias, because we don't have any of Papias' writings, we only have records of it through other writers. In his writing, he passes on to us other accounts of the sayings of the Lord belonging to Aristion, who has been mentioned above in the tradition of John the Elder, which is the Apostle John. For our present purpose, we must add to his statement already quoted above a tradition concerning Mark, who wrote the gospel. This has been set forth in in these words, And the elder used to say to me this, Mark, having become Peter's interpreter, wrote down accurately everything he remembered, though not in order, of the things either said or done by Christ. Now that sounds kind of disparaging at first. You're like, wait, he just wrote them down in haphazard fashion? Like, oh, there's some cool stories. I threw them into a hat. I pulled them out. Hey, hey, voila, the book of Mark. No, when he's saying it's not in order, what's interesting about this is, the early church fathers recognized what was so distinct about Mark is unlike Luke, for example, who explicitly says that his gospel is chronological so that you might know with certainty the things that happened during Jesus' ministry, Mark wrote thematically. He recorded everything that Peter recorded, said, and he put these, uh, uh, Peter's eyewitness account into a thematic gospel, not in chronological order, but in order to have instructive purpose. And that's actually really important for us as we study the book of Mark so that we get out of Mark what we ought to get out of Mark. Similarly, um, Clement of Alexandria says that when Peter had publicly preached the gospel, those present who were numerous urged Mark as one who had followed him for a long time and remembered what had been spoken to record what was said. And he did this, handing over the gospel to those who had asked for it. And when Peter got to know about it, he exerted no pressure either to forbid it or to promote it. Now, that sounds kind of fanciful, that last sentence. I don't, I don't, know, I don't even know how Clement would know that. But it is interesting that all of these, all of the accounts, and there's, there's many more, I'm not going to read all of those, but many, 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 many church fathers talk about Mark, and they are unanimously agreed that it is the eyewitness account of Peter. And most, like this one, would acknowledge that it was written before Peter's death. In fact, I think there's only one church father. I think Papias is the only church father who, who said that it was after Peter died. So Mark is writing in Rome to a Roman audience before 62 AD, likely in the 50s, probably the second gospel written. And he's writing where Matthew has a gospel written to the Jews, answering the question which would have been the question for the Jewish audience in Judea, if he is the king of Israel, how would, did he die a cursed death? How is he still the king of Israel? And Jews seek for signs. Well, Greeks search for wisdom. And so Mark's task was to prove and demonstrate that Jesus was indeed the son of God, even though he died an ignominious death. And to a Greek audience explains and fills in some of the Jewish details that Matthew doesn't need to because he's writing to a common, uh, an audience that has common knowledge. And so here we are, reading Mark. Mark has, you know, Matthew has a lot of Old Testament quotes. Mark has minimal. Matthew virtually needs to explain no background 
Mark does a lot of explaining the background. And you can see why, because of who, who Mark is writing to. And so when you think, wait a minute, John Mark, he wasn't an eyewitness of Christ's earthly ministry. Well, Peter was. And we, and we have the inspired account of Peter's eyewitness testimony through the pen of Mark. And that's what we get to study for the next 60 plus sermons. I say plus to give me a little bit of freedom. But there is technically 60 narratives in the book of Mark that we're going to study one at a time. And uh, so 60 plus, 60 to 120. Give me that. Okay, I'm just kidding. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. But there's, it's just, a, it's a powerful book. And we have through the pen of Mark, the, the inspired account of Peter's eyewitness testimony. Now, before I dive in to look at Mark itself and study it on its own terms for our exposition of the first 16 chapters. Um, there's only 16 chapters, if you, if you weren't aware. That's a bad joke if you're not aware of the book of Mark. But I do want to make a comment about the structure here. It's interesting. I, I've studied the book of Mark pretty intensely for, for about 10 years. It's, just been, it's captivated me. It's captured my mind, and I've, just been, I've been so impressed with it. And I've been very impressed by a lot of people who look at Mark and just say, there, there's no possible way to outline this. There's no structure here, so pick an outline, just here, you know, throw some labels on it, who, who cares? And in studying the book of Mark, I, I realized, you know, Mark actually does have a rich structure. And I'm not going to bore you with that, because we're going to, I'll just point, the, point out where it's important as we work through the book of Mark in, in, in a timely fashion. So rather than bore you by talking about a, a structure, I just want to point out that there is a structure, and it actually has a huge impact in how you read Mark. So here's three indicators of, of the structure, three things that he uses. Oh, sorry, I need to go to the next slide there. Um, three elements of the structure of Mark. Geographical refrains, the threefold refrains, and the bookends. He uses bookends, and I'll, I'll show you a couple examples of these. But all that to say, when we walk through the book of Mark, and I'm showing you how he groups the narratives together, I'm just telling you, this is not arbitrary. It's not something I came up with. I'm just reporting to you what Mark actually did. Mark actually structured his book this way. And it's going to be super important to, to recognize that. So um, I just read so many authors who said it's impossible to diagram the book of Mark. And I'm sitting there, I keep going back to Mark. I'm like, well, people keep telling me I'm not supposed to be able to do this, but Mark's showing me that it's done. I think I'm going to stick with what Mark said. <laughs> so Mark has a structure. I'm just going to be faithful to declare it. I don't know why everybody thinks that it's not there, but it's there. So there we go. I got that off my chest. All right. You might think, fine and well, John, don't spare me the details. I don't need to look at a bunch of geographical markers right now, but why is it important? And that is the right question. If you're asking that question, you're asking the right question. Why is that important? It actually is extremely important to understand the stories that Mark includes. When Mark, you know, when he writes these stories, don't imagine that Mark, you know, he just sits there and he's thinking like, Oh, yeah, you remember that one series that Peter did over on the west side of Rome? Man, he, and he, he launched in that story. About, oh, yeah, include that one. That's a good one. And he just comes up with a random list of stories about Christ. Cool stories. An anthology of the words and works of Christ. Not at all. He groups them together within refrains and within bookends to, to make a singular point. And all four sections of Mark prove conclusively that Jesus is the Son of God. And it declares to the reader what it means for Jesus to have the path prepared before him and for followers to get on that path and what it's going to take. He breaks up his gospel so thematically that the reader is left with lessons that penetrate the heart so that he understands, if I do not give up selfish ambition, it will derail me and prevent me from following Christ along the way. Yesterday, um, my family, uh, we, went, uh, we went hiking. We had a little bit of time in the afternoon, so we were going to go hiking. And um, Smith had mentioned a, a, a hike um, on Peralta Trail. Maybe you guys have hiked that. Maybe you're familiar with that if, if, you, if you're a hiker. And so I'd heard the name, and then the Beerys came over yesterday, and so then they mentioned that they'd hiked it, and they said, oh, that's a great trail. So we decided to hike Peralta Trail, and uh, this, this trail goes up the, the east side of the Superstition Mountains. So we hike up this, this trail, and we get about, you know, there's, there's a shoulder that, that, uh, between these two uh, canyons, these two big massive uh, valleys. And so we we're about a half mile from, from the top, from the saddle there, and uh, we hear this helicopter, and it's hovering down kind of back by where the, um, 
um, parking lot would have been, where we left our car, it was about a couple miles away from us. And uh, the only reason I knew it was a couple miles because we had been hiking it. And um, but the, the helicopter was, you know, tiny, and I could just see it by the this rock outcropping that, that I knew it was kind of near the parking lot, though I couldn't even see the parking lot. And it was just tiny; it was sitting there hovering. So we're watching that, and we're like, "Oh, that's impressive." And we, I kind of had a, a gauge of how far away that helicopter was because I had seen it right next to the parking lot. Thought nothing more of it. We keep hiking. We get to the very top, and then there we are. We're seeing this massive butte on the other side that we hadn't even seen the entire hike. We cross over the over the shoulder, and then you can see this other valley, and it's just massive in its expanse. And there's this tiny, it's not tiny, it's just this narrow butte just pointing straight up into the sky. And we're sitting there staring at it, and we're like, this is an impressive view when the helicopter comes flying around uh, from the right. And he entered that canyon. I don't know who he was looking for or what he was doing, but he comes flying across. And as I'm, as I'm seeing the size of the helicopter and I'm seeing the size of the butte, it was just, it, what struck me was I, was, I could tell, man, that helicopter is tiny. And I know it's got it's to be at least two miles away from me because it looks about the same size as it did earlier. And it was just flying. I'm like, man, he's about to, he's about to fly behind that uh, butte there. And all of a sudden, when he crosses the line of sight on, those, on the cliffs on the right, suddenly I realized he's in front of the cliff. And in a nanosecond, my perspective went from thinking of this butte and picturing it in my mind as this big, it suddenly became that big. Because the perspective and the contrast with the helicopter suddenly showed me, that thing is miles away. And it is massive. And my perspective just changed. You know, and I thought about, and because Mark was on my brain, I thought of this. I thought of the book of Mark, and I thought of that reality of your perspective changing. And I could say the same thing. If I grabbed any story at random from the book of Mark, we could study that story in a vacuum and say, that's a really impressive mountain. It's like looking at the butte without the perspective of the helicopter. But when you put it in Mark's context, context, it's doing something so much more. Suddenly you see it for its grandeur. You see it for its, its greatness and its power and its glory. It has implications for your heart and everything else. It just snowballs into effectiveness. And so that's why it's important to know that there is a structure for Mark. Well, briefly, let me just describe a couple of characteristics here. A few characteristics of Mark. Mark is a fast-paced book. And we're going to try to, I'm going to try to match that. I'm going to try to be fast-paced. Um, my goal is to just preach one sermon for each narrative. And some of those narratives are long. And the reason why is because sometimes Mark might tell a story within a story to make a point or to make a contrast. And so I want to keep that all together and preach a sermon on a story within a story, even if it's really, really long. And so we're going to try to match the pace. He uses the word immediately. 41 times, immediately, immediately, immediately. More than any other gospel writer, I think more than all the, gospel, all the New Testament writers combined. Another interesting thing about Mark is the, the way Greeks tell a story, there's a particular word that they use when they start a new story. It's just very common. Mark doesn't use that word. He just joins them all up with the word and. You might think that's not very interesting. Well, it totally stands out if you're reading Greek narrative because it's just not the way you do it. And so here's Mark saying, the theme is, here's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he did this, and he did this, and he did this, and he did this. And you get to the end, you're like, he's God. It's just so fast-paced. There's vivid detail, incredibly vivid detail. You can tell Peter was a phenomenal storyteller because Mark's a phenomenal storyteller. And there are details about the glances and the looks of Christ and his emotion and the emotion of the players in the story that, that you don't read anywhere else. There's an incredible pragmatic effect of the way Mark tells stories because by the time you, you understand how he structured his sections and his stories and put them together, it just pulls at your heart and brings profound conviction. And this is why I've come to love the Gospel of Mark. And so what we're going to do this morning is rather than tell you about how he tells stories, or tell you how he structures his gospel, we're going to dive right in. What I've done is I've, I've given you some slides, and these slides kind of highlight a couple of the details there. I, I couldn't do all that I've mentioned, you know, with, with all those details, but each one of those sections there, each one of those four acts in the book of Mark, uh, begin and end with a bookend story that uh, matches 
uh, that parallels one another. And uh, I'll point that out to you. And each one of those four sections also has a threefold refrain. It's very thematic. And I'll show you that threefold refrain in each of those sections. So in the remaining few minutes, we're going to fly. Are you ready? You think we can do it? I'm, I'm counting right now. I'm going to see how many of you are nodding, how many of you are shaking your head. Okay. All right. It's, I, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that I'm putting on myself. We're going to just get through the book. You, you can't read the book of Mark in an hour. So uh, what am I going to do? Well, this is not an improvement on Mark. This is just an explanation of the flow of Mark. So trust me, we're not, you can do better than this. You can just read it on your own. But I want you to understand and appreciate what you're reading. So this is a flow through the book of Mark, paying attention to how he tells his story. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 is the introduction. This might disappoint you, but in light of the fact that Mark begins with a quote from the Old Testament, he knows that that's common knowledge to his readers. And next week and the week after, we're going to look at this quote. Because he quotes from a combination of Isaiah 40, Malachi 3, and uh, Exodus 23. He puts it together in one quote. And he says, of course, you know that prophecy. And there's three threads of that prophecy that we need to be familiar with to understand how Jesus is actually the fulfillment of all of those prophecies. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a couple weeks just looking at the Old Testament and then, Lord willing, three weeks from now, we, I plan to come back and look at uh, verses 1 through 8. That introduction is so critical because it's the directive of the whole gospel. Notice that the quote begins from um, Isaiah in verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make, way, uh, make ready the way of the Lord. The Isaiah 40 quote talks about the way of the Lord. God's going to come to earth. He's going to come to Jerusalem. He's going to bring comfort to God's people. In verse 2, he's quoting from Malachi, and it also says, Behold, I send a messenger ahead of you and who will prepare your way. Both of these Old Testament passages are talking about the way of the Lord. And we'll see that Exodus 23 is also talking about the way of the Lord. This gospel shows that God has come to earth, and here's his path, here's his trajectory, and he wants to set it straight for the reader so that we can follow him. To finish up the introduction, verses 9 through 13 show that God arrives, and this God who arrives, he's, this man is God, and this God is man. First of all, man's a God because he gets baptized, and God says, this is my son, I'm, I'm pleased. And this God is also man because he can actually be tempted. And then Mark launches into Act 1, verse 14, all the way through chapter 8, verse 21. This is a shocking identity, a shocking identity. Mark takes time and detail to explain Jesus comes to earth, this is God the Son, and his identity is actually quite shocking. I mean, he said it at verse 1, this is the Son of God, but it doesn't seem like anybody in the story seems to get that point, with the notable exception of the demons. Demons call him the Holy One of Israel. Demons are described as knowing who he actually is. Demons call him the Son of God in Mark chapter 3, verse 11. Not the Pharisees. Not the people of Israel. Not even the disciples. No one calls him son of God, but the demons. This is a shocking identity. And it's interesting, the, the, the refrain here is unbelief, hardness of heart. And I, and I do want to show you this refrain. That's about all we're going to have time for is showing you refrains and bookends here. Look at chapter 3, verse 6, or verse 5, sorry, verse 5 and 6. After looking around at them, and this is referring to the Jewish leaders who are watching him on the Sabbath just to see if he'll actually heal I mean, think about the irony here. I wonder if this guy's going to heal and do something like break our tradition. Let's catch him. Let's catch him doing something nice for someone on the Sabbath. And they're just wanting to set him up for failure. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. I mean, the Pharisees and Herodians have nothing in common except hostility towards Christ. And this is unbelief, hardness of heart. That refrain continues. Look at chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus, among his own people in Nazareth, this is the hometown crowd, 
and he wondered at their unbelief. Why didn't they believe this is the Son of God? And you start to understand when you see that refrain, and, and all these refrains are threefold, every single act has three of them. I've shown you two of them so far. You can already appreciate why Mark begins documenting Jesus' priority on teaching and his teaching ministry. People are impressed by his miracles. He's even saying, let's get out of here before more people want miracles because I came to teach and to preach about the kingdom. That's what I'm about. And he's preaching the kingdom. He's preaching repentance. He's identifying himself as the son of God. And is anyone going to listen? That teaching is authoritative. It is clear. It is powerful and is penetrating. The hostility of the Jewish leaders just continues to rise. It starts out with the inner monologue. It becomes verbal with their disciples. It becomes verbal to Jesus' disciples. Then they start attacking him directly by the end of chapter 2 before he just flat out is done with them, chapter 3, verse 6. Then when that refrain is repeated in chapter 6, he's talking about the people of Israel. Are the people going to believe? Are they going to respond? Answer again is no. The third refrain, shockingly, has to do with the disciples. Mark chapter 8, verse 17 to 21. Jesus, aware of this, aware that they were discussing, hey, we don't have any bread, and he just told us, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And who packed the lunch? Peter, was it your job? You, you, you forgot to bring the lunch bill? They're sitting there arguing about lunch because he's talking about the leaven of false doctrine. And aware of this, he said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Goes on to quote Isaiah 6 again, which he's already quoted in the teaching of the parables from chapter 4. But skip down to verse 21. He was saying to them, do you not yet understand? This refrain happens three times, documenting the Jewish leaders, the Jewish people, and then the disciples. It's such a shocking identity, the disciples are struggling to get their mind around it. The identity of Jesus as the Son of God is quite shocking. This whole section reveals that apparently the only, only the demons are the ones who get it yet. Act chapter 2, a shocking mission. A shocking mission. This next section of the book of Mark, from chapter 8, verse 22, all the way through the end of chapter 10, is a powerful section, and the refrain here is the prediction of suffering followed by the most arrogant and ambitious response of the disciples. I mean, it, it happens like clockwork, and when you read these three accounts, it's almost laughable if it wasn't true, and then by the time we get to the end, you're going to think, that's hilarious, except it's kind of like me. <laughs> and so look at what happens. Jesus um, predicts his suffering and in chapter 8, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. He was bold, unapologetic. This is what's going to happen to me. Prediction number one ends in the middle of verse 32. The response of Peter begins in 32b. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now that's the mark of someone who believes this is the Son of God. <laughs> oh, Jesus let me set you straight here. Look, I already, I already identified who you are. Previous story, verse 27. They say, who am I? Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. Future king. You're going to reign. That's why we're with you. I mean, I love that idea. So get on the throne. We'll roll out the red carpet. Jesus says, yeah, this is, this is what's in store for me. And Peter has the audacity to rebuke him. Turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. And that's not overspeak. Jesus is not exaggerating. This is not, some, this is not a sinful comment. This is not a sinful jab. It's very deliberate and it's very edifying because that is the role that Peter is playing if he's going to rebuke the Son of God. Why is he called Satan? Because you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. You're never more satanic than when you're man-centered. 
Prediction number two comes in chapter 9. Chapter 9, look at the middle there, verse 31. He was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he's been killed, he'll rise three days later. But they did not understand the statement, and they were afraid to ask. <laughs> There's your answer to the question from chapter 8. Do you not yet understand? He starts teaching them more truth. And they're like, I don't understand. But they don't say anything, because they already tried to correct him. Peter rebuked him in, the, in chapter 8. They tried to correct him in, earlier in chapter 9. That didn't go too well. And so they just remained quiet. Verse 33, they come to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had been discussing with one another which one of them was the greatest. <laughs> I mean, it's okay to laugh. We're going to laugh at ourselves too, but... <laughs> It's not okay to laugh at the disciples and not laugh at yourself. I mean, that's just hilarious. When you read it in the original, the Greek uh, words, it's like a, has an article with all the descriptions. It, they, they, they were silent because they were having the which one was the greatest argument. <laughs> that's the way it reads in the original. I kind of like transliteration and bring it over. It would be bad English, but that's what, he, that's what you read there. They're having the which one of us was the greatest argument. That's what we were talking about on the way. And I imagine all the disciples just... <laughs> he goes on to instruct them in verses 35 to 37 about what greatness in the kingdom really is he teaches them a profound lesson in 38 and following about amputa am amputating ambition which will ruin your ministry and prevent you from following Christ prediction number three comes in chapter 10 verse 32, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. I mean, it's true that they don't have spiritual insight and understanding, but they're not stupid. He knows what it means to, when I go to Jerusalem, they're going to hand me over, and I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to, I'm going to rise again on the third day. I mean, they, they don't have insight, but they do know the meaning of those words. So as he's walking toward Jerusalem, you better believe they're scared. And he again took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to die and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. No conjunction, no transition, no break. Next verse. James and John, two sons of Zebedee, come up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we can sit on your, uh, on your right and on your left in your glory. The density of it all. Here's the Son of God telling them what's about to happen, showing them this is the path, and I'm making clear the path for you to follow, and all they can think about is glory and thrones, kingdom and rule. It is a shocking mission that Jesus has come for. And to be consistent, Mark... Again, bookends this section. Just as he bookends the first section with the call of the disciples and the teaching, the, the men and his message, he ends it by asking if they even understand his message. Well, in a, a, chapter 8, verse 22 to 26, we read a miracle about a healing of a man who is blind. In chapter 10, verse 45 to 52, we read about a man who is healed, who is blind. But these two men have something important to teach us. Now, of course, this is a historical fact. Those men are actually healed, and he actually even uses the proper name in the second case. It's Bartimaeus, probably someone that the Roman church would have known personally, or at least knew a relative of. But what's profound about the way Mark structures this section is he records for us a, the only healing in the entire scriptures, any healing of any uh, done by Jesus Christ that is ever performed incompletely or in stages. And so you can see there the bookend it's a healing, it's healing blindness progressively. The healing of this blind man, he's, he's healed progressively. Jesus 
touches him and he says, oh, I can see, but I see trees, like men like trees walking. So he knows that it looks like a tree, but it acts like a man, so it must be a man. He just doesn't see clearly. And so then he restores his sight entirely. The first narrative of this section, who am I? Peter says, you're the Christ. And for the next three chapters, let's work on healing that spiritual sight. You need to see more. All you see is Messiah, messianic reign, and coming kingdom. You don't see clearly. When Bartimaeus, on the other hand, in chapter 10, is healed, he's calling him Jesus, son of David. He's pleading for mercy. He says he wants to see. Jesus heals him, and he immediately jumps up. He's praising Christ, and he immediately began following him on the road. Bartimaeus did something that the other 12 have not seemed yet to do, which is follow Christ vigorously without fear, knowing that Jesus is going to the cross. That's spiritual sight, my friends. It's a shocking mission indeed. Chapter 11 begins Act 3. Act chapter 3, I'm, keeping, I'm trying to keep my pace here. A shocking reception. A shocking reception. Just like all the other sections, chapters 11 through 13 are bookended by discussions about the temple. Well, the Olivet Discourse, obviously, everybody's probably somewhat familiar with. In chapter 13, it's this long discussion about the, the future destruction of the temple. It's going to be destroyed. And chapter 11 begins with a triumphal entry. And what you might not have remembered is that at the end of the triumphal entry, he ends up in the temple. I mean, all the way back to chapter 1, verse 2, when Mark quoted the prophecy of Malachi 3, he knows everyone's expecting, Yahweh, whom you desire and whom you've set your delight, he is going to come suddenly into his temple. That much is true from Malachi chapter 3. And Mark comes along and says, yep, here's the story of Jesus and how he did it. And in chapter 11, after the triumphal entry, he goes walking into the temple and nothing happens. I mean, after 400 years, fulfilled prophecy, and you're expecting break out the, the banners, break out the military, have a parade, go send letters, send, send letters, goodbye letters to Caesar. I mean, our Lord has come to his temple. And he walks into the temple and he looks around and leaves. Nothing happens. The threefold refrain explains this shocking reception, because this re re shocking reception is nothing but a rejection. And the threefold refrain is his enemies, who are his own people, coming to him over and over and then over again to question him. Chapter 11, verse 27, he's questioned by the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. In chapter 12, verse 13, he's questioned by the Pharisees and the Herodians. In chapter 12, verse 18 and following, he's questioned by the <laughs> intelligent and the ignorant. Uh, and those, are told, those stories are told synonymously, parallel side by side, from verses 18 all the way towards the end of chapter 12. And so this criticism and this hostility, this questioning, this interrogation, this trapping, this intent to catch Jesus in his own words continues for three chapters, virtually the entire, entirety of the Passion Week. No wonder he cursed the fig tree, symbolic of the temple and, and symbolic of Judaism. It had leaves, showing that it should have fruit already at that time of year. If it already has leaves, the fruit should already be there. That's the way fig trees grow. And here's a triumphal entry. The people are saying, Hosanna, throwing down their cloaks and the palm trees in front of him. He goes into the temple and nothing happens. Curses the fig tree. It ends with the Olivet Discourse, telling of the future destruction of the temple. Act chapter 4. A shocking rejection. A shocking rejection. The last three chapters of the book of Mark document Jesus' shocking rejection. 
And after understanding what he's done so far in these first three acts, you might think there's really not a lot of rejection that could be shocking at this point. I mean, what, are, what could Israel possibly do to him? It seems like they've already rejected him. So maybe you think maybe it's a mistitled section. But of course, there's a reason for it. The refrain here is that Jesus is led Three times he's led by his enemies passively. The last time he goes anywhere actively is in chapter 14, verse um, 32, when he goes to Gethsemane. And from Gethsemane on, he is led three distinct times, matching the threefold prophecy of of Mark chapter 10. They're going to hand him over, they're going to hand him into the hands of the Gentiles and hand him over to the Gentiles and they're going to condemn him to death. And that happens in 14... 53, all the way through chapter 15, verse 15. They're going to mock him, scourge him, spit upon him. And that happens in verses 16 to 20 of chapter 15. And they're going to crucify him, and he's going to rise again. That starts in chapter 15, verse 20b. They lead him three times. Unsurprisingly, Mark has bookends. The bookends here are women who followed Jesus Christ. They were his followers. You can see in verse, chapter 14, verses 1 through 11, the faith of a woman pre-crucifixion. In the Passion Week, before he goes to the cross, before Passover, he tells the story of an unnamed woman who anoints him in preparation for his burial. Jesus praises this action and says, truly, wherever the gospel is preached, this woman's action will be told about her because it's an act of faith. But don't miss that Mark bookends this story with verses 1 and 2 and verses 10 and 11. Passover and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. They are in the plotting stages of killing Christ. And here's this woman anointing him for his burial. Verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went out to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And they were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. Follow the Son of Man on the way. You are going to be at odds with everyone. And you've got to be okay with that. This woman was. Let's skip over to the last story, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. And Mark ends his story very abruptly for good reason. And the last story is a story about the women. And it's really a story about the fear of women post-crucifixion. It's a little bit of fear and faith. It's a reticent faith. Because they have enough faith that they want to go honor Christ and they go to Um, anoint him after he died, but not yet understanding his predictions and not yet understanding the Old Testament, they go and thinking he's still in the tomb. The angel shows up, says he's not here. He's going ahead of you, verse 7. Go tell his disciples. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there just as he told you. Verse 8. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I'm like, what a way to end the book. It's a perfect ending for Act 4. The ominous omission, the only inconsistency to this structure, is right here where there is nothing to match the introduction. Jesus is the Son of God. John the Baptist came to prepare his way so that his people could follow him in the way. And this was his path. The conclusion doesn't need to be written because it's supposed to leave the reader hanging, examining, am I following him in the way? Why this fourth act? Why call it a shocking rejection? Well, I'll go back to the climax of this story. The most climactic scene comes in the middle of chapter 15. 
They bring him to Golgotha in verse 22. It's called the, translated the place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. He didn't take it. Well, that's a big, what's the emphasis there, John? Why the big point? Because I already mentioned to you, he, it's almost like everything is happening to him passively from going to Gethsemane until now. And this is the only exception where in the middle of the narrative, those who are crucifying him are trying to give him wine to alleviate his suffering. And here, he's, no, he's not passive at all. He says, not at all. I'm not touching this stuff. This is the Son of God who has come to suffer and give his life as a ransom. And to mitigate against that suffering is to interfere with his very purpose. He goes to the cross unnumbed to experience the whole event. Mark starts to document hostility in verse 27. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right, one on his left. Verse 29, the passers-by were hurling abuse at him. I mean, this is the passers-by? I mean, this is people who'd have, who have nothing to contribute to the story. They just happen to shop at the grocery store on the other side of Golgotha. They just happen to be walking by in their normal occurrence of life, and they start hurling abuse at him, mocking him. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. Verse 31, in the same way, chief priests also along with the scribes were mocking him among themselves, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Ironically, true. Because he can't save others without, by, by saving himself. Verse 32, the third party of mocking is those who were crucified with him. 32b, those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. You step back and say, but you know what? That rejection is not shocking. That's been happening since chapter one. Now, all of that hostility against Christ is told in the background. The way Mark tells the story, he puts that in the background and he picks up the action sequence in verse 33. And here is the shocking rejection. The sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which translated as, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the Son of God, who in every instance recorded of him communicating with his Father, he calls him Father. And the Father-Son relationship has been severed. He is now the object of his Father's wrath, darkness, prophesied of the day of the Lord in the Old Testament is now being manifested on earth, but it's not being poured out on the nations. It's being poured out on the Son of God. And Scott just shared it in the communion. This is the perfect Son of God. If he were not perfect, he could not ask the question, why have you forsaken me? Because there would be a ready answer. Because you sinned. But it is a legitimate question, and there is no answer. Someone hears him calling out when they said that, and they think, oh, he's calling for Elijah. So someone runs and fills a sponge with sour wine, puts it on a reed, and gave him a drink, saying, let's see if, you know, trying to preserve his life. Let's see if we can keep him alive until Elijah comes. Maybe, maybe Elijah will come take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I mean, the king, the true king, came to his temple and he was rejected. And the temple responds when he dies. Verse 39, when the centurion was standing right in front of him. The centurion, a Roman. This Roman audience would have read that, would have been able to identify he saw the way Jesus breathed his last, and he said, truly this man was the Son of God. It's a shocking rejection because his father rejected him, not for something he had done, but because he bore the sins of many. And then a Roman centurion 
the first and only human player in the entire Gospel of Mark, calls him the Son of God. Not the Jewish leaders, not the Jewish people, not even his own disciples. A Roman centurion. My goal for the exposition of Mark is I want us to become more familiar with the gospel. I want us to fall in love with this gospel. I want us to understand it so that we can read it and benefit from these stories uh, as long as Christ um, waits. And all those might be good and proper goals, but the ultimate goal of the Gospel of Mark is that God would be glorified through his Son. And the effect of this Gospel ought to be that we have awe and amazement at the person of Christ. The effect ought to be that we would gladly follow Jesus through any, all of the hostility of the world. You know, Christians all profess to worship Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That's common to every professing Christian. Even heretical forms of Christianity would say as much. What's incontrovertible, the incontrovertible mark of a Christ follower is somebody who loves following Christ more than his own life. Who's willing to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. That Christ is their God and he worships them with a life that is expendable if only it would glorify God the Son, Jesus Christ. This book is living and active. Obviously, the whole Bible is, but so is the book of Mark. And my prayer is that it would do that for us as we study it in the coming, coming weeks, coming months. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to study the gospel of Mark. And we just pray, Lord, that you would indeed prepare us even now for the richness of seeing Christ on the pages of Scripture, seeing the response of Sinners who were slow, lethargic, sinful. Sometimes they had blind spots um, that were handed to them by the religious context that they lived, lived in, but most that were documented in chapters 8 to 10 were self-inflicted blind spots. And Lord, I just i am so thankful that the, this, this, this book has the power and the ability to deliver us from our blind spots. Uh, there's a thousand ways, Lord, we could be unfaithful to you and not follow you on your way and on this path that you've laid out for us. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would equip us for that through the study of Mark. We ask all of this so that you would have a great name, so that you would have glory among everyone who runs into a member of GBC. Uh, so, Lord, we're asking this for your glory to, to spread throughout Tempe, throughout Phoenix. Um, Equip us through the book of Mark to do that. In your name we pray. Amen.